Mantle didn't hide anything. You could see Mantle's whole life on his face. The fair-haired kid playing baseball for the most storied franchise in the history of sports. He was perfect. For that time period, he was the perfect fit. He wasn't larger than life, he was life. But yet, he still had this aura about him that he was just like one of us. On the ball field, there was something very dignified and heroic about the way he carried himself. But Mickey's life overall was not always a study in dignity. A lot of sadness, there's a lot of regret, and there's a lot of tragedy involved. He was a stronger, bigger man when he knew he was dying than he ever was in life. He was a bad boy sometimes, but when he was good, he was very, very good. There was something dramatic about him coming out of the on-deck circle and walking toward home plate. There he was. Oh, gosh. No matter what you were doing, you automatically, your eyes went right to him. You hear this rumble through the stadium. And then the fury. He put his soul into every swing. All the muscles and the straining in his neck. He said, I put everything into my swing, including my teeth. One of the things about Mickey, there was always that potential, you know. He never quite knew. Something great was about to happen. It just exploded off the bat. Oh, Ooh, oh wow. Oh, God. It was going up. Holy cow. Up. Get out of here. Up. Get out of here. It looked like somebody had taken a gun and just shot a bullet right at the facade. Look where he hit the damn ball. I could close my eyes and see the arrows showing the trajectory. 374, 118, how high it was, where it hit, and how far it would have gone. They would bring in these scientists, rocket scientists, and say, well, if it would have cleared the stadium, that ball could have gone 700 feet. Maybe hit an alien on Mars, and they'd have some cartoon, some, you know, extraterrestrial go, hey, where did this come from? You know. There was something about Manolet screamed out, the natural. He's a God-made ball player. It stirs the imagination. You could make a case that no one in the history of sport ever fit a team, a town, and a time more perfectly than Mickey Mantle. From the early 1950s and into the 60s, the Mick was the quintessential American athlete the center fielder and centerpiece of the most dominant and visible team in sport, the New York Yankees. Nick, how would we do today out of the stadium? You win we the won two, two games. Yeah. How did you do? Well, I got three hits. Three hits. You know, I don't want to mention that one of them was a home run, do you? Number yeah. 41, ladies and gentlemen. He was humble and often shy. Attention made him uncomfortable, but he could not escape it. For a generation of adoring fans, Everything Mickey Mantle did mattered. The way he smiled, the way he ran out his 536 home runs, the way he played 18 big league seasons through crippling injuries and late night carousing. And even when his playing days passed and his three MVP awards and seven World Series championships had been committed to memory, those same people embraced the Mick's private struggles their childhood hero proved just as flawed and human as they were. To them, Mickey Mantle always mattered. He was a true American icon, fair-haired, innocent, indestructible. But up close, he was blemished and vulnerable, an almost mythical character raised in the Dust Bowl at the height of the Great Depression, as far from the big city as one could get. Elsie's Cafe, that's where we ate dinner at. Down Main Street in Commerce, 
was Highway 66. We go down and sit on that rail and watch these people go by going, I guess it's California or New York. It wasn't stopping in commerce. The vast majority of the people around here, some way or another, were attached to the mines. Mutt worked most of the time underground. He was what we all called ground boss. They dug shafts. They may be 200 feet deep. They may be 450 feet deep. It was dangerous. There were lots of people killed. And most of the deaths were from huge slabs falling upon people. It was into that dark world of danger and death and the zinc mines of his hardworking father that Mickey Charles Mantle was born on October 20th, 1931. He was the oldest child of Mutt and Lovell Mantle of Commerce, Oklahoma, a likable and mischievous kid from the start. He was a great kid. Everybody wanted to be around Mickey because he had good ideas about things to do. He'd come up with all these games that was fun for him, but uh, I'm not for sure everybody else in the game was having that much fun a lot of times, you know. He'd take us out to the chat balls, and I had a BB gun. He'd line us up, count to 10. And we had to be a certain distance away, <laughs> or we'd get pelted pretty good. I was a majorette in the band. He and his friends came to the football game. I thought Mick was the most handsome guy I ever saw. He had a crew cut and he had the Commerce High football jacket on. They called him the Commerce Comet. He was fast and fearless, no matter which sport he played. But Mickey Mantle was born into baseball. He was named after his father's favorite player, Mickey Cochran, a Hall of Fame catcher from the Detroit Tigers. And with baseball in their blood, father and son formed an uncommon bond with the game and each other. The biggest thing in his life was when his dad took him to St. Louis to see the Cardinals. My dad didn't drive at probably 35 miles an hour. It was 300 miles to St. Louis. It took us more than a day to get there. Mickey would always say, Dad, I can run faster than you're going. He'd say, OK, get out. He certainly didn't want his children following in his footsteps. He wanted Mickey to have a better life. And he had a great love for baseball. Mutt was very serious about his training of Mickey. Dad got off work at 4 o'clock. Mickey had to be here every day. He'd always be right here as soon as his dad got home. It was trouble, big trouble, if he wasn't here on time. They had a little old plate down there, and he'd stand up at the plate. They practiced until you couldn't see. He would pitch right-handed, and my granddad would pitch left-handed to him. He was teaching Mickey how to switch hit. He got to where he could hit a lot of home runs. He could hit them a long ways. Now, we did get the chase ball around on the other side of the house when they went over there. You never seen him without a baseball bat. They played for hours and hours. They were obsessed. Mutt was pretty hard on him. Mick told me I could do really, really good in a ball game, and Dad never said, you did well. He said, you can do better. That really made Mick try even harder to please him. He'd have done anything in the world for his father. Soon after high school, Mantle signed a contract with the New York Yankees. In the minors, he was an erratic shortstop, but he could hit. In his second year at Joplin, Missouri, Mantle led the Class C Western Association, batting 383 with 26 homers and 136 runs batted in. He was proving to be quite a bargain. 
Tom Greenway was really the only scout he talked with. He said, I'll give you a Yankee contract and $1,100. That's what me he got for signing, $1,100. Mickey Mantle came to the Yankees in 51. Casey Stengel, the manager of the Yankees, promoted him, talked about him endlessly through that first spring training. There was a tremendous dynamism about Mantle. He was like a runaway Mustang. Mickey could do it all. He could run. Oh, boy, could he run. They said, watch this kid. He could run like a deer. One morning, they were going to see how fast everybody was. And they lined up all the outfielders. When he ran, <laughs> it looked like the other guys were standing still. We found out he could run like a deer. Where did this guy come from? Man looked like the kid that could deliver your paper. The high noon sun. The hayseed from Oklahoma, literally carrying a $7 suitcase. He's the caricature of the bumpkin looking up at the skyscrapers, and the head keeps going up and up. We stayed at the Concourse Plaza Hotel, and uh, we got to be very good friends. I was 19 years old, and he was 18 years old. We had dress codes, and Mickey would buy some lousy ties. We ate a lot of hot dogs and cheeseburgers or pizza. We didn't know what the hell to do. It wasn't just off the field that Mantle had trouble. After a dazzling spring and a hot start to the 51 season, Mickey struggled. Maybe the Yanks had made a mistake in sewing the number six to his uniform. A not so subtle hint that he was expected to follow in the mythic footsteps of numbers three through five, the last of whom was entering his final season. He never had time to settle in. The moment he set foot in Yankee Stadium. The first day, he was the heir, the successor to Ruth and Gehrig and DiMaggio. Boy, that's a load to put on a 19-year-old kid from Commerce, Oklahoma. There were fans that booed him every time he came to the plate. Wait a second, he's supposed to be the next great one, but he doesn't play that way. He makes mistakes. He strikes out too much. And watching him kick his glove and break his helmet and show temper and pout, things they never saw from the great DiMaggio, was a very, very hard transition for Yankee fans. You're striking out and people calling you a bum, go back to Oklahoma, and uh, Joe really never was friendly with Mick. You know, he never really tried to make him welcome to the team. When Mickey came with the Yankees in 51, Joe DiMaggio didn't talk to him for half the season. Having the fans and the media put on him the burden of the great Yankee icon just overwhelmed him. On July 15th, manager Casey Stengel told a still struggling mantle he was being sent to the minors in Kansas City. There, Mickey's hitting troubles continued, but by fate, he was just a short drive from Oklahoma and his father, Mutt. He was down in the dumps. His dad decided he should go to Kansas City and visit with him, and did. And when he got there, Mick told him, he said, I think I may as well quit. I think I may as well give up the game. Give him a real good tongue lashing. That's all the guts you have? Then get your stuff together. We'll go home. I'll put you to work in the mines. You can do that the rest of your life, just like I'm done. He wanted his dad to sympathize with him, and he did not. They talked most of the night. I was hoping he wouldn't pack his bags. He said, well, Dad, I want to stay here, and I want to try to make a go of it. Well, all right, if you stay here, he said, I want you to quit acting like a baby and get out there and play ball like you can. That bristled him up, and boy, he went back there, and I mean, he started hitting that ball. It wasn't long after he returned to the team in August 1951 
with the less daunting number seven on his back, that New York's love affair with Mickey Mantle began. In his first 14 seasons, the Yanks went to 12 World Series, winning seven. A powerful switch hitter with blinding speed, Mantle was at his best in the mid-50s. In 1956, he won the first of his consecutive MVP awards, as well as the Triple Crown. At a time when television brought baseball into the living room, Mantle was a star of stars. The magnificent Mickey, just 20 years old, as the liner is left center for base hit. Here comes Mickey with a rounding third, coming in to score. Mantle backing up and makes the catch. That ball is going, going, it is on. Yankee Stadium, Madison Avenue, Main Street. The Mick was popular everywhere. Women loved him, men admired him, and every kid wanted to grow up to be just like him. If you're gonna build a baseball player from scratch, you'd go, just forget the plans, him. Just make it him. He could do everything. He was so fast. The power was amazing. When you're a little kid, you went, oh my God. It was a comet with a hat on. There was a fury. There was an explosiveness that was very, very appealing. Mantle brought an energy and just brought a wildness to the plate. Mantle's at bats were explosions. Boom! Mantle belts it over the fence in right field. The ball will go. Yeah! And there it goes across Bedford Avenue and deep into a parking lot. What was sort of ironic is that occasionally he would lay down a bunt. Mantle's speed was part of what Mantle was. I mean, he was extraordinary getting down to first base, getting around the bases. You just count sometimes how great a fielder he was. Mickey outran the ball. He was that fast. Take the base here. I'd rather lead the league in uh, runs batted in, home runs, and hitting. And that's my goal for this year. He was such a leader. It picked you up as a team. You know you could never be on his level. But, buddy, I'm going to tell you one thing. You tried. You broke your fanny trying to equal him. He was one of those players who wasn't just good. It made you feel good to just watch him. There's talent, but then there's just his raw presence. First of all, he looked like he was from Central Casting. He was dashing, he was handsome. And he was graceful. He had a boyish look about him all the time and a great smile and he smiled a lot. You saw Mickey Mantle and you liked him. The all shucks part of his personality was very endearing. When I come up to the big leagues, I was a shuffling, grinning, head ducking country boy. But that charming drawl, that country boy bullshit is, was great, you know. And he was absolutely ripped. He stretched those pinstripes to their limits in his upper body. And no steroids. He didn't need steroids. In fact, we didn't know how to spell it back then. He was the first person that you saw in your life who was bigger than life. Mantle and Wheaties, they're still a team. Hey, hey, hey! He's on his way. He'd be on everything. He'd be here, he'd be there. Get on your way. He was so big, he actually did an ad for cigarettes and also for not smoking. So he did one for smoking and one for not smoking. Must have been a couple of hundred bucks here or there. I'll do it. Now, tough words from perhaps the finest baseball player the world has ever known, Mickey Mantle. I want my baseball. I want my maple. Mickey called me up a couple of weeks after the commercial was running. George, what a pain in the ass. I said, what's the matter? 
Wherever I go, the kids are yelling at me, I want my maple, I want my maple, I want my maple. Everybody wanted to be connected to him, to be a part of him. It was absolute myopic hero worship. He was the most important thing in our lives. Kids were painting number seven on their T-shirts. Everybody had his righty and lefty batting stance down pat. We all tried to run like Mickey. It looked like he was a piston. His arms went up and down instead of this way. We limped like Mickey limped. I used to fake knee injuries when I was a kid. I learned how to long divide so I could know his batting average because I wanted to know what he was hitting when I went to bed. I wrote a poem about him when I was like 10 or 11 or something. From a pinstripe shirt, his arms do come. Like massive stone, they appear to some. For these are arms that compare with few when a normal man wanted to make two. And it kind of went on for a while. <laughs> Even when he'd be out at first base, the way he would reach behind his helmet and scoop off his batting helmet from the rear and toss it to the bat boy, so elegant. Nobody could do it like the Mick. Even the name, Mickey Mantle just float. When people said that name over and over again, Mickey Mantle. 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 Let's go and watch Mickey Mantle. I'm just glad his name wasn't Cy Schwartzstein. When you say Mickey Mantle, you say baseball. He just was like Superman. But the truth is, he was just a regular guy. He just did the little things all the time, and he just had this little smirk on his face. We were getting ready to go out, and Mickey had just uh, combed his hair, and he looked at the mirror, and he goes, boy, you're handsome, he said. <laughs> you know, because he knew I walked in the room, and it was going to get a laugh from me. He had a tremendous sense of humor. I was the first guy to be hair dry in the clubhouse. He put powder in it one day, I turned it on, I turned white, you know, that was metal. He didn't want to be a hero. He just wanted to be Mickey and one of the guys. Try as he might, it was impossible for Mickey Mantle to be just one of anything, let alone one of the guys. His God-given ability and almost accidental charm set him apart. He was a baseball star who eventually became as comfortable and dynamic off the field as he was on it. His eyes were so big and so wide open, he quickly learned that there was a lot of fun to be had in New York City. The other Yankee players took his gee whiz attitude and they said, all right, kid, we're gonna show you the big town. And they took him to the nightclubs in New York, to the Copacabana, to the Latin Quarter. And he became a regular at Toots Shore's restaurant. They go out and hang out at Toots Shore with Sinatra. They felt like they were special, like they owned that town. Watch a movie from the 50s. The star of the show's got a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other. It was cool to drink. They drink, and they chase women. We always had something to do. At about 11 o'clock, I said, I'm going home. I said, I have to catch tomorrow. You guys do what you want. You wait till you talk to Whitey. He'll tell you some stories. They've all been told a 100 times, and I have nothing new to add to it. <laughs> Beer was in the clubhouse. Bottles of beer all over the place, so he'd have two or three just to replenish his fluids. Well, he's already got a buzz on. He said, well, I was drunk before I left the ballpark. Then I go out and have a couple of drinks and dinner. Now I'm really plastic. They wanted me to stabilize him. Well, there wasn't much I could do with him. We knew there were nights that he was out. He'd walk in the clubhouse, and Hank Bauer and I would say, oh, God, if we could check his eyes, that we probably had a bad night, which some of us did in the old days. One night we were in New Jersey with Yogi Berra and his wife. Mick was really having fun. 
And as we drove out of the parking lot, Yogi screams, Merlin, I wouldn't ride with him. And about two blocks down the street, Mick hits a telephone pole. And I had a concussion because I hit the windshield. I could have been killed. And along the way, it got out of control. Yeah. And of course, Mick had a lot of time to spend in New York by himself because I wasn't there. Merlin Johnson and Mickey Mantle were childhood sweethearts who married soon after Mickey's rookie season of 1951. Two years later, when Mickey Jr. was born, the family bought a home in Dallas. Merlin settled there, while Mickey spent most of his time in New York. As the years passed and the family grew, Mickey continued to drift away, leaving Merlin with the responsibility of raising their four young sons. Mantle was a distant father, the baseball star who never grew up. Of course, the Yankees' clubhouse of that era was just like Neverland, with Billy Martin as its Peter Pan. One of their teammates had a real beautiful girl in Cleveland. Dad and Mickey got home from the clubs, and so they had enough liquid courage in them. They decide they're going to climb around and peek in their teammate's window to see this beautiful girl. There's about a two-foot ledge around the building. I believe they're on the seventh or eighth floor. They decide to climb out the window. Mickey's leading the way. They end up having to go all the way around the corner. Luck has it, the shades are drawn. Oh, come on, Billy, let's go back, says the Mick, and my father tells Mickey that he can't. There's no way he's going to be able to turn around and go back the other way. And they have to continue to walk all the way around the hotel to climb back in their window. Where Mickey was introverted, my father was extroverted. When they were just so close, they would become like brothers. Mickey got a great kick out of Billy's pugnacious personality, and what you did when you were a friend of Billy Martin was go out and drink and raise hell. When I was a kid, I, I didn't really know what to make of it. I just thought it was funny. They would have fights at the Copacabana, and they would be partying, and then the next day they'd win 17 nothing. We were staying in the St. Moritz. We were watching the Honeymooners. Right in the middle of the program, he turned to me, hey, Blanche, he said, do you ever think about dying? I said, are you really concerned about that? He said, yeah. Mantle's fears were far from unfounded. Early death was in his blood. When he was 13, he watched his grandfather die from Hodgkin's disease. Two of his uncles were also taken young, each before the age of 35, again from Hodgkin's. Mickey was convinced he would meet the same fate, especially when he watched firsthand his father begin to succumb to that same horrible disease during a bittersweet World Series visit. He came to the World Series the first time he ever saw me play baseball in New York. He came to the series in 1951, and that's when I hurt my knee. DiMaggio was playing center field, and Mickey was in right. And it was a fly ball hit between the two of them. At the last second, Joe hollered, I got it. And Mickey slipped on that drainage thing out in right center field. He just absolutely stopped flat like this. I turned around and said, my God, he's dead. Well, he was taking me to the hospital the next morning. When I got out of the cab, I couldn't walk, and I was leaning on him, and he just keeled over. And that's the first time I had known he was sick. Mantle watched the rest of his first World Series in a hospital room, out with torn cartilage in his knee. In the bed next to him was his dad, who over the next six months deteriorated at the hands of the Mantle family curse. His dad could not lay down, he could not sit down. It's excruciating pain. It was sad, he didn't last too long after that. He passed away the next May after that World Series. When my dad died, he said, well, it might be a little rough, but we'll make it. I don't know what we would have done if it hadn't been for Mickey after dad died because 
there was us four kids still at home. But we got a check every time he got paid. Mick lived with that. I mean, he was terrified of getting a Hodgkin's disease. It just never was the same for Mick because he needed him so much. I've lived without a, a dad since I'm 15. And Mickey was 18, so I know that feeling. I know that loss when you do something great, you want to pick up the phone and say, hey, you want to look in the stands and see him go. When you don't have it, it's a big hole, and you either come to grips with it and value the good times, or you remain this hurt little kid and do stuff to make it try to disappear. And that's what he tried to do. This young kid inherits fear. He inherits, I'm next. He inherits a death sentence. I'm gonna die before I'm 40. That fear drove him to despair. It drove him to the bottle. It drove him to, who gives a shit? I'm a dead man. Mickey Mantle lived the rest of his life with emotional and physical pain. It was difficult to tell which took more of a toll. Although it's hard to imagine how he played it all with 15 bone fractures over the course of his career. He played with every kind of imaginable injury that an athlete could possibly have. He was playing center field. He couldn't raise up his arm, but nobody knew it except the trainer and the ball players. If you know Mantle, he was going to play if he could walk on one leg. And I don't know how he could do it, but he was hurt all the time. Despite his injuries in the early 1960s, Mickey Mantle was still a great player on a great team. The Yanks were in the World Series each year from 1960 to 1964, and won in 1961 and 62. In 61, he challenged Babe Ruth's single-season home run record. And in 62, he won his third MVP award. In the 64 World Series, Mantle hit three homers, raising his total to a World Series record 18, including the winner in Game 3. It was his last great October moment, as decades of Yankee dominance came to a sudden end. Do you enjoy baseball any more now than when you first broke in? I enjoy it uh, just as much. I get a bigger kick out of hitting home runs now, and it uh, seemed like uh, we'd win a lot more, and when we win a game now, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> After averaging 37 home runs a year his previous 10 seasons, Mickey Mantle never topped 23 after 1964. And once a lock to bat 300, the Mick was a 250 hitter his final years in pinstripes. It was as painful to watch as it had become for him to play. He used to wrap himself every day, you know, both legs all the way up to the thigh down to the ankle with these big, thick, cushioned wraps. You take that big swing and go down on one knee like that, and you just feel the pain, you know? Yeah, it was tough. He'd run into third base and, like, sort of tiptoe, so because he couldn't come to a sudden stop. But what's he doing at first base? We wanted to win so bad. I've seen him go 0 for 4, and we lose by one run, and he go down and stop crying. And yeah, he was my idol down there crying, and it, and it was sad. You could feel that he was going down. It's never depicted more precisely than Mother's Day 67, when he hits the 500th home run on what is a dank early spring day. Come on, there you go! Watch him go around the bases that day. Mickey, how long do you think you'll be playing? Well, I hope I can play another two or three years. I'd like to uh, hit 600 home runs, and I need uh, about 85 more, so that's why it will take a long time. Mantle never did come anywhere near hitting that 600th home run. During spring training in 1969, he announced his retirement, simply saying, I can't play anymore. I have to quit. 
He tumbled to 237 in his final season. He lost his lifetime 300 average that year. And that was his great regret, was hitting 298 lifetime. He says, I was a 300 hitter. This is one of the proudest moments I've ever had on this hallowed baseball ground. The magnificent Yankee, the great number seven, Mickey Mantle. I've often wondered how a, a man who knew he was going to die could stand here and say that he was the luckiest man in the world. But now I think I know how Lou Gehrig felt. I'll never forget it. God bless you all, and thank you very much. Mickey was a lost child without baseball and he had nightmares. In one, he was always trying to leg out an infield hit, and he never got it, never made it. The other dream he had was he was late getting to the ballpark. He heard his name being called. He couldn't find a gate that was open. And he could see Billy and Yogi and Whitey and he was trying to crawl through this fence. He got caught at the hips and couldn't get through. Then he'd wake up. He always felt he didn't do well enough. An image of his father just looking down saying, you screwed up, kid, you screwed up. He never could be what his father wanted for him or expected of him. It just wasn't good enough. There was always a sadness, I thought, about him, a wistfulness about him. Any knowledgeable person who saw Mantle at his best would tell you that Mickey Mantle was one of the 10 best non-pitchers who ever breathed. But no matter how great he was, he felt he did not achieve all he should have achieved. He thought he truly had a chance to come close to being what Babe Ruth had been. He just felt like he had dissipated so much just off the field lack of sleep, too much carousing. Now, he's as much to blame for that as fate may be, but there was that might have been quality to Mel. What might have been? What could I have been? When we got out of baseball, we were broke. People would say, what are you going to do now that you're retired? And I said, go look for a job. Mickey, the same thing. He didn't have any money. I'm not a mental heavyweight, you know, and uh, I was a little bit worried of how I was going to make money. He had several businesses. Uh, he tried to run a restaurant. He was in an employment business with Joe Namath. But none of them were satisfying emotionally, and none of them were businesses where he made a great deal of money. After his career ended in ball, is when it really started getting bad. Because, I mean, a lot of his jobs, you know, after he retired were cocktail parties, banquets, people always expected him, hey, have a drink, you know, have a drink. That's how he dealt with the people. He was a shy person, a few drinks, and he was the life of the party. Buddy, if we'd had a great tasting beer that was less filling in the old days, can you imagine where we'd be now? Yeah, the Beer Drinkers Hall of Fame. Over time, Mantle used the bottle to grow closer to the kids he once neglected. It was a desperate attempt to make up for lost time. He and the boys, who were now grown, had become drinking buddies. Well, the alcohol actually helped us build a relationship that we'd never really had, because that's how we got together. He said that he felt it was kind of like having Whitey and Billy with him did build our relationship and so we loved it it was all fun and glory hey where can we go next what can we drink next how much can we drink next looking back on it that was not a way to get to know somebody especially your father we just felt like that's the only way we could get close to him i never felt that we did have that connection as children 
He couldn't come to our games because people would bother him. He would have to sit in the car and watch the games. Sometimes we wouldn't even know he was there. One time he took us to the Harlem Globetrotters. We were there five or 10 minutes and people just started hounding him and stuff and we just had to get up and leave. When dad was home, we would have backyard football games. You could see in my dad that he enjoyed it, but he didn't really know how to express himself as a father. And a lot of it was he was gone. We didn't know this guy that was this huge personality. It was a hard childhood because our mom raised us. I spent most of my life alone. They never had the company of their dad. They did not have the discipline. It got pretty difficult when they all began to be teenagers. I took my first drink at 13 or something. We did so much partying, it's not even funny. You know, I was doing drugs then, doing cocaine, drinking, and I was pretty out of it. We put ourselves in some very stupid and dangerous, idiotic situations. I was living with five active alcoholics. I was one crazy lady. I had four kids and Mick. You never felt at home anywhere, never felt comfortable anywhere after baseball because he was never in his element. He always felt like there were no strings attached. He treated himself like he's a free agent out there doing whatever he wanted to do. By the early 1980s, Mantle's life had become a mess. His family and marriage washed out in a drunken haze. Professionally, he was going nowhere. In 1983, he was briefly banned from baseball for taking a job with a casino in Atlantic City. He had no choice. He needed the money. Billy Martin. <laughs> Did you get that trap shot? But he would soon find a new and profitable way to capitalize on his fame. Don't film the putt. This incredible memorabilia era began in which people would pay money for a Mickey Mantle shirt, for an autographed ball. He said, boy, if I had known that, I would have saved all my dirty jocks. But he did make a great deal of money, which really changed his life. I thought he was one of the funniest people I'd ever met. And I think that was one of the things that really attracted me to Mickey was a sense of humor. In providing funds to young researchers, as well as the more established, the Deafness Research Foundation. What the Here these motherfuckers <laughs> going down. <laughs> One good thing about being deaf, you don't have to listen to that shit, right? <laughs> During the memorabilia craze, Mickey hired Greer Johnson, a business manager, who helped organize his resurgent career. Mantle's autograph had become the most sought after in the industry. Johnson also became the new woman in his life a life which had now become increasingly like his old one. Once again, Mickey Mantle found himself on center stage, dealing with the spotlight. In his playing days, Mantle could be difficult with his fans and the media. He was uncomfortable with the attention and struggled to understand it. As a middle-aged ex-ball player with no heroics left to provide, his incomprehension turned to resentment. We'd see people come up for an autograph, and I'm talking about 40, 45-year-old men. Oh, my God, that's Mickey. Grown men would cry. Literally, tears would come down their cheek when they would meet Mickey. I mean, it was almost like a revelation. It was almost like a religious experience to these people. And Mickey just, you know, he just didn't understand that. He never really understood why he was beloved why an adult male like me, I'd walk into a room and if he were there, I sweat and I follow him like I'm six. He didn't aspire to that. He didn't pretend to be anything but a kid from Commerce, Oklahoma. Why did they love me so much? I just played bleeping baseball. He tried everything in his power to undo that. God damn. I don't give a shit about the hair. Let's get this over with, all right? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the hair. It may have been the liquor talking, but the hero his fans still worshipped had become a broken and bitter man. 
I walked up to Mickey Mantle and introduced myself. I'm probably one of the first kids in this country named after you, born in 1953. Mickey Mantle was so drunk, he looked at me and he said, you know what, kid, you know how many kids in this country are named after Mickey Mantle? He said, go away, don't bother me. More than not, he was an unattractive drunk, and you winced when he acted boorishly or worse toward other people. You wanted to climb under the table. After four decades of abuse, Mantle realized he had hit bottom. In 1994, he finally reached out for help after admiring the courage of a close friend and a member of his family. I'd been drinking 17 years at this point, and so I took the initiative and checked myself into Betty Ford's. I didn't even tell anybody in my family that I was going. He was scared to death. He didn't want to admit he was an alcoholic. Nobody does. After I got back to Betty Ford Center, he started asking me questions about what it was like. And I knew eventually he was going to say to me, uh, can, you, can you get me in? And that ultimately is what he said. You could see Mantle's whole life on his face. Mantle left the Betty Ford Clinic with a vow to stay sober. But his will was promptly tested when his son, Billy, who had battled both Hodgkin's and drug abuse, died of a heart attack at 36. Soon after, Mantle went public with his guilt, his shame, and his lost opportunity. Because he was a public figure in a different way than the kind of cheap celebrity that's everywhere, he perceived some responsibility to tell his story. I had to write my dad, who's been dead since 1951, I had to write him a letter things that I didn't do for him. I wasn't there for my kids like my dad was for me. And you talk about something that's hard to do, that, that's really hard. But I need to tell him I love him. It's tough to face. What do you have in life, ultimately? It's your family. He said once he wrote that letter to his dad, it made it easier for him to express himself to us. When you got to Betty Ford Clinic, you received more letters than anyone who's ever been. I really didn't realize until I started getting those letters what I did mean to some people. Let's hope you've got a lot of years left to continue to write chapters in your life. What do you hope for? I hope the people at the end will say, he turned out all right. I'm proud that I named my son Mickey. That would be nice. That was the beginning of his life, really. After his public acknowledgement, Mickey Mantle was at peace for perhaps the first time in his life. Over the next 18 months, he embraced sobriety and became a better, happier man than he'd ever been. He proved he could overcome drinking, but in the end, not the abuse on his body the drinking had caused. Mickey was sick, in need of a new liver. And after just two days of waiting, one was found. His liver tests were getting worse. And if he hadn't gotten transplanted when he did, he wouldn't have lasted another week. Mickey Mantle went into surgery about 4.30 this morning local time. The liver transplant operation is expected to last four to six hours. Once the surgery was over, uh, the whole question that we had anticipated, did you pass other patients to do him? Why did he get one so quickly? There are a lot of people out there who absolutely believe to this day, no matter what facts they hear, they believe that Mickey Mantle got preferential treatment. But I am here to tell you that I was there, and I know that he didn't. The donor's information was input into the computer, blood group, body size, that sort of thing. And when the list popped out, Mickey Mantle's name was first. As soon as he was physically able, Mickey Mantle was moved to make a public plea as memorable as any of his mammoth home runs. There is a sense of tragedy, a beat up Wayne Mickey Mantle, but he wanted to send a message. I would like to say to the kids out there, to take a good, you talk about a ro role model, this is a role model, don't be like me, you know? I mean, God gave me a body, a ability to play baseball, and that's what I wanted to do. It was just wasted. I was given so much. I blood. The famous line that 
he always used, always had half truth in it. It started out as a joke, but he said, if he had known he was gonna live that long, he'd have taken better care of himself. He said, I did things wrong, and he says, I made mistakes. Don't live like I did. He wanted people to know that he woke up and saw the mistake he made, and that wasn't any way to live your life. As a son, it was just very uplifting. I want to start giving something back. It seems to me like all I've done is just take. He had the heart of a lion. He was so brave that it just made you thrilled to just know him. I think that took more courage uh, than anything. It was a great message to the kids. In my mind, he's as strong in a batter's box and as sturdy of leg as he's ever been in his life. And he faced it with more strength and more courage than he may have even thought that he had himself. It was his greatest hour. It was his greatest message. Because that had some effect on people. It's Mantle, you know, it's the Mick. And, you know, he's on TV telling millions of people, I help myself too little too late. But what he did do is help thousands, if not millions, of other people think twice about letting their lives get out of control. Intent on making amends for a life he felt he'd thrown away, Mantle started a foundation to raise awareness of the importance of organ donation. Its impact was immediate as donations increased across the country. Mantle looked forward to witnessing the creation of a new legacy, a heroism he could understand, saving lives. But it wasn't to be. During his liver transplant, doctors had found cancer. At first, they believed it was treatable. But within a month, they realized they faced an unusually aggressive strain. Hi, this is Mick. About two weeks ago, the doctors found a couple of spots of cancer in my lungs. I'm hoping to get back to feeling as good as I did when I first left here about six weeks ago. I'd like to again thank everyone for all your thoughts and prayers. You've been great. And if you'd like to do something really great, be a donor. I told him that uh, this was a problem that we didn't have a cure for. Oh, well, we were floored. You know, they basically said, you know, there's no hope. I wrote him a letter and uh, told him pretty much how I felt and what he meant to me all those years. He knew that I loved him. You know, I wanted everything to be okay with us before he died. time telling we loved him and a lot of people don't get that chance to tell someone they love that they love them. After the Mantle family's tearful goodbye, Mickey's sons reached out to their father's baseball family, the friends who Mickey loved, whose respect meant so much, his old Yankee teammates. On the eve of his death, August 13, 1995, they rushed to Dallas to say goodbye to their friend, Mickey Mantle, a great teammate who mattered to them as much as he did to an entire generation. When we hugged each other, we grabbed our hands and, and he says, I love you guys, I love you both. And we said, we love you too. It's a sad day for the Yankee family and Yankee fans everywhere. Today we have lost one of our own, one of the greatest ball players in the history of baseball. Please join now in a few moments of silent prayer as we all remember, we all remember Mickey, Mantle. Mickey Mantle. Every boy builds a shrine to some baseball hero. 
before that shrine, a candle always burns. For a huge portion of my generation, Mickey Mantle was that baseball hero. I felt that my childhood had finally ended, and I was in my 40s. It's been said that the truth is never pure and rarely simple. He was that humble kid that dealt with struggles. And then in the end, took another one deep. Died a hero. The emotional truths of childhood have a power that transcend objective fact. They stay with us through all the years. They say you never forget your first love. There's a part of him that you carry with you your whole life that doesn't ever go away. None of us, Mickey included, would want to be held to account for every moment of our lives. But how many of us can say that our best moments were as magnificent as his? His mystique and his aura is a legacy that'll never die. It'll go on forever and ever and ever. I just hope God has a place for him where he can run again and smile, that boyish smile. As God knows no one's perfect. God knows there's something special about heroes. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports. Mantle didn't hide anything. You could see Mantle's whole life on his face. The fair-haired kid playing baseball for the most storied franchise in the history of sports. He was perfect. For that time period, he was the perfect fit. He wasn't larger than life, he was life. But yet, he still had this aura about him that he was just like one of us. On the ball field, there was something very dignified and heroic about the way he carried himself. But Mickey's life overall was not always a study in dignity. A lot of sadness, there's a lot of regret, and there's a lot of tragedy involved. He was a stronger, bigger man when he knew he was dying than he ever was in life. He was a bad boy sometimes, but 
when he was good. He was very, very good. There was something dramatic about him coming out of the on-deck circle and walking toward home plate. There he was. Oh, gosh. No matter what you were doing, you automatically, your eyes went right to him. You could hear this rumble through the stadium. And then the fury. He put his soul into every swing. All the muscles. It was a home run, you? Number 41, ladies and gentlemen. He was humble and often shy. Attention made him uncomfortable, but he could not escape it. For a generation of adoring fans, everything Mickey Mantle did mattered. The way he smiled, the way he ran out his 536 home runs, the way he played 18 big league seasons through crippling injuries and late night carousing. And even when his playing days passed, and his three MVP awards and seven World Series championships had been committed to memory. Those same people embraced the mix's private struggles. Their childhood hero proved just as flawed and human as they were. To them, Mickey Mantle always mattered. He was a true American icon, fair-haired, innocent, indestructible. But up close, he was blemished and vulnerable an almost mythical character raised in the Dust Bowl at the height of the Great Depression, as far from the big city as one could get. There's Elsie's Cafe, that's where we ate dinner at. Down Main Street in Commerce was Highway 66. We'd go down and sit on that rail and watch these people go by, going, I guess it's California or New York. It wasn't stopping in Commerce. The vast majority of the people around here, some way or another, were attached to the mines. Mutt worked most of the time underground. He was what we all called ground boss. They dug shafts. They may be 200 feet deep. They may be 400. His dad took him to St. Louis to see the Cardinals. My dad didn't drive at probably 35 miles an hour. 300 miles to St. Louis. It took us more than a day to get there. Mickey would always say, Dad, I can run faster than you're going. He'd say, OK, get out. He certainly didn't want his children following in his footsteps. He wanted Mickey to have a better life. And he had a great love for baseball. Mutt was very serious about his training in Mickey. Dad got off to work at 4 o'clock. Mickey had to be here every day. He'd always be right here as soon as his dad got home. It was trouble, big trouble, he wasn't here on time. They had a little old plate down there, and he'd stand up to the plate. They practiced until you couldn't see. He would pitch right-handed, and my granddad would pitch left-handed to him. He was teaching Mickey how to switch hit. He got to where he could hit a lot of home runs. Get hit them a long way. Now, we did get the chase ball around on the other side of the house when they went over there. You never seen him without a baseball bat. They played for hours and hours. They were obsessed. From 50 feet deep. It was dangerous. There were lots of people killed. And most of the deaths were from huge slabs falling upon people. It was into that dark world of danger and death and the zinc mines of his hard-working father that Mickey Charles Mantle was born on October 20th, 1931. He was the oldest child of Mutt and Lovell Mantle of Commerce, Oklahoma, a likable and mischievous kid from the start. He was a great kid. 
Everybody wanted to be around Mickey because he had good ideas about things to do. He'd come up with all these games that was fun for him, but uh, I'm not for sure everybody else in the game was having that much fun a lot of times, you know. He'd take us out to the chat balls, and I had a BB gun. He'd line us up, count to 10, and we had to be a certain distance away. <laughs> or we'd get it pelted pretty good. I was a majorette in the band. He and his friends came to the football game. I thought Mick was the most handsome guy I ever saw. He had a crew cut and he had the Commerce High football jacket on. They called him the Commerce Comet. He was fast and fearless, no matter which sport he played. But Mickey Mantle was born into baseball. He was named after his father's favorite player, Mickey Cochran, the Hall of Fame catcher from the Detroit Tigers. And with baseball in their blood, father and son formed an uncommon bond with the game and each other. The biggest thing in his life was when he was straining in his neck. He said, I put everything into my swing, including my teeth. One of the things about Mickey is there's always that potential, you know. He never quite knew. Something great was about to happen. It just exploded off the bat. Oh, Ooh, oh wow. Oh, God. It was going up. Holy cow. Up, get out of here. Up, get out of here. It looked like somebody had taken a gun and just shot a bullet right at the facade. Look where he hit the damn ball. I could close my eyes and see the arrows showing the projectory. 374, 118, how high it was, where it hit, and how far it would have gone. They would bring in these scientists, rocket scientists, and say, well, if it would have cleared the stadium, that ball could have gone 700 feet. Maybe hit an alien on Mars, and they'd have some cartoons, some you know, extraterrestrial go, hey, where did this come from? You know. There was something about Mandelet that screamed out, the natural. He's a God-made ball player. It stirs the imagination. You could make a case that no one in the history of sport ever fit a team, a town, and a time more perfectly than Mickey Mantle. From the early 1950s and into the 60s, the Mick was the quintessential American athlete the center fielder and centerpiece of the most dominant and visible team in sport, the New York Yankees. Nick, how would we do today out of the stadium? You win we the won two, two games. Yeah. How did you do? Well, I got three hits. Three hits. You know, I don't want to mention that one of them.